Hello and welcome to the Cornwall Channel and on today's show I'm joined by David Haig. So David, it's great to actually finally get you on the show because I've known you for quite a few years now uh, and we've never sat down to do an interview and this is kind of like a live story because the guy from Cornwall has been involved in some of the biggest uh, news stories, uh, media attention, so we've got a lot to cover today uh, but I want to go back to the very beginning for you really which is, were you born in Cornwall? Uh, well, yeah, and like I said, it's, I mean I wasn't born in Cornwall but it's been a bit of a roller coaster yeah. over, the, over the last kind of few years. But no, I was born up in, in, in um, the people in Cornwall probably hate me for saying this now, but it, near Manchester. Um, and um, then my parents gradually moved down. So when I, but when I grew up down here as a kid, I went to school here, college, etc. Yeah. Um, and um, and I'm still here now. Uh, well, I know another thing which kind of baffles me, and I think a lot of people will, because we know obviously you live in Cornwall, you, you grew up here, but then you've gone on to, to be involved in some huge things. So, you know, when you were growing up, yeah. what did you want to do as a job? What was kind of your focus? Well, initially, I mean, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to be a lighthouse keeper. <laughs> that, really? That was, uh, I think that was the first thing. And, and, um, but when I realised that that wasn't happening anymore, I mean, I think when you, you, know, you grow up as a kid down in Cornwall, you want to be a, a, you know, a sportsman yeah. or you want to be a lighthouse keeper or a pirate. Um, but then when you grow up, you realise that that's not possible to do any of those things anymore. So, um, I mean, I, I wanted to get into politics, actually, or journalism. Um, and so when I was um, at college down here, I used to go, I used to write for the Cornishman, the local newspaper. Yeah. Um, and I used to go to Radio Cornwall as a production assistant on their sports um, Saturday sports program, um, and that's a long time ago now. So How I used old to basically. It's college. So what's that? Eighteen. Wow. The kind of no, I think 16, 17, 18, So I did that. But I was the youngest um, Cornishman correspondent. I was about twelve or thirteen at the time. Wow, so I used to go to things like parish council meetings and write very boring, boring <laughs> write-ups of, of you know what happened at the local yoga class and, and, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, that was yeah, I was twelve when I started that. So it's, that was the journalism thing. I wanted to kind of go into journalism, um, and then somehow that changed to law via football to princesses. Well, that's what I, that's the transition I want to uh, come to because obviously you talk about writing for the Cornishman. You know, you're working in Cornwall. When did you leave Cornwall, and where did you go? Was it from Cornwall straight to Dubai? No, so I left. Um, I, I went to University of Southampton. Okay. It's kind of the nearest university that that was very good at law. That was near as near to Cornwall as you could get. I don't yeah. want to go too far away. So I went to University of Southampton, um, and then obviously parents lived down here, so I'd come back all the time. Um, and that was um, three years. Went to law school, and then. Um, um, trained as a lawyer in London, um, and but you know came to Cornwall an awful lot because you, I, even now I mean I've you know I live half London half here I can't quite bring myself to leave yeah. so I have to stay down here and then and go backwards and forwards up on on the train or the the, the roads to London. Well, I was going to say you got them. We went. I was at yours last night, and it's an incredible uh, incredible place. But one thing before I go on to football and of course Leeds was, did you like football? So when you were growing up, did you have an interest or a passion or even any knowledge uh, in the world of football? Well, not really. My, my parents were from Leeds, so they were okay. Leeds fans. Um, and, and so, you know, my, my parents would watch football and, you know, I'd sit and watch national football yeah. at home, you, you know, or, or, sorry, international football. Um, and, but not really, and, you know, you went to school down in Cornwall as well and it's, you know, if you like football, you're a bit of a weirdo. It's rugby. Yeah. It's rugby, rugby, rugby. And, you know, I mean, people didn't even play football at school and, of course, in Cornwall, you've got no big football teams. You know, you've got to go to Plymouth across the, yeah. across the Tamar, and that, you, know, you can argue whether it's a good football team or not, but <laughs> you've got Plymouth and Exeter. But if you, you know, if you want Premier League football teams, you've got to go up very far. So if you're a little kid and you're interested in football, Cornwall wasn't then and still isn't yeah. now the place where you, that interest would be encouraged, whether you want to watch it or play it, which is something that we can talk about later that I'm interested in. But So not football, really. It was always rugby, rugby, rugby. And because I'm tall, like yeah. everyone was like, he's, you know, he's, he's a tall bloke, get him to do rugby. But um, yeah, so not, not football. So... Going from that to becoming the managing director of Leeds United Football Club, how did that even happen? I mean, what's the story behind that? Because the, from knowing you, I, there doesn't seem to be a smooth journey into that. It's kind of like from doing what you were doing and straight away you were there. Yeah, it was a very, it was a very kind of strange and convoluted way. I mean, I, I moved to the Caribbean um, after be, living in London for three years. 
um, and worked on, on setting up legal structures for, for various companies, which was really nice because, you know, you live down in Cornwall, you're used to the beach and the good weather yeah. and sailing and surfing and everything. And the Caribbean was kind of the same, but an awful lot warmer. So I lived there for three years um, and then moved to, I had a choice then from a, a, a working in law again, either to move to Asia or to Dubai. And this was, this was a good 15 years ago. And so Dubai 15 years ago was not what you see now. You know, it wasn't all the giant towers and, and, yeah. and, and things like that. So it was, just, it was just really starting to take off. So I decided to move to Dubai. And ultimately, I ended up working for an um, Islamic investment bank who had been through a, a spot of bother in terms of the crash of property. So their reputation needed a bit of improvement. And they thought, well, what's a good way of doing that? And, and I came up with this, which I regret now, a, a, a rather silly idea. Why don't you go and bid for some big British brand? Even if you don't buy it, it will, it will help with media and things like that. So I suggested things like Fortnum and Mason and, you know, these yeah. iconic British brands. I think at the same time, Aston Martin was, was, being, was up for sale. Um, and then all of a sudden, the investment team came back with the idea, oh, let's go and buy a football club. Leeds is for sale. Um, and then I remember mentioning it to my parents. They were like, don't you dare. <laughs> um, and so, I, I mean, I was the head lawyer in the group. So it was my job to negotiate the, the, the deal. The owner then was a guy called Ken Bates, who used to oh, own well, Chelsea. Yeah. Um, so he's the chap that sold Chelsea to the former owner, Romeo Branovich. Um, and, you know, Ken is a legend in football. I mean, he you know, had Chelsea yeah. older before Leeds. Um, you, you know, real, real kind of the godfather of football, I used to call him. Um, so I spent nine months negotiating the deal with him, and he was in Monaco. The bank was in Dubai or Bahrain, and the club was in Leeds. So I lived on a plane. I was literally going wow, around in circles, yeah. um, and I got on with him. You know, he's, he's a you know self-made multimillionaire, really a really nice guy, legend when it comes to football. Um, and um, but then, as the lawyer, once the deal was done, it was my job to kind of step back and pass it on to the, the investment people. Um, but they were not used to dealing with a football club and people in the north of England and Ken Bates, um, who are very old school. Um, so I remember, I remember at one point an audit committee came in and they were concerned at how many paper clips the club was using because they were putting paper clips on the season tickets. And so, I mean, it was that level of ridiculousness. Wow. Um, and then because it was an Islamic bank, they were concerned of the income coming from things like alcohol, things from betting, all the things okay. which are banned in the religion. And of course, the things that prop up sport in this country are alcohol, betting, yeah. and, and financial services. So that became even more of a problem. So there became a bit of an issue between the Ch Ken, who was still the chairman, um, and the, the team there, and the people back in the Middle East, because there were two, you know, two very different cultures that really didn't get on. And you, know, you, can't, you can't imagine banning alcohol in a British football club, it it's unthinkable. Well. Apart from the fact that in terms of that's most of where the income comes from sport when you look at betting advertising, alcohol advertising, and then alcohol sales. Try and ban that at Leeds, it's not gonna happen. So basically there was lots of disagreements and because I got on with Ken, I was, one day I was told, right, you're gonna go be the managing director because Ken likes you. So that's how it happened. Wow. And, I, and I was sitting, yeah, I, I knew nothing about football. Knew, well, I mean, I knew watching it on TV, but running a football club? Um, you know, I'd been, I was basically an evil corporate lawyer that set up things like investment funds and, and bought and sold companies. Um, and then you're told you're going to go and run a football club in the north of England with Ken Bates overnight. <laughs> and, um, That's crazy. Yeah, it was. It wow. was. Um, but then I got on with him. And, you yeah. know, if, you, if, if, if you're going to get taught by someone in football, he's probably one of the best. You know, he's been in it forever. And I was also very lucky because the then managing director was a guy called Sean Harvey who left to become the CEO of the Football League. So I had two giants to train yeah. me. So I was very fortunate. I mean, it's the best football club in the world, obviously. I mean, I'm sure some people may argue, but it's, 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 they wouldn't win on that one. But um, so that's how it happened. Um, and, you know, even getting to that point was a crazy ride because, you know, you, you, you see a lot of golf investors in football now um, and a lot of foreign investors coming to English, English sport. It's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and but they usually have lots and lots of money. You've seen Saudi recently buy um, Newcastle, yeah. billions and billions and billions. Um, sadly, that wasn't the case in, 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 in the, the, the people that I worked for at the time buying, buying, buying leads. They didn't have the cash. Um, and lots of newspapers were calling them things like potless. So you had all these expectations from the fans that billions and billions were coming in from the Middle East, but there was really nothing there. So that's when all these kind of issues then started. Um, in, in terms of, you know, and that's a very th different thing about football. You've got, fans always want expensive players, but they don't want to pay more for their tickets. So you have this yeah. really difficult balancing act that you're never going to win. And so th that's how it started. 
Well, I mean, I know you were really well received by the fans. Um, you know, they, they really did take to you. And I think it was a good move in the sense of making you the managing director because, pe- you know, people did take to you. But it did go sour. I mean, I, I from research, I know you actually put together a consortium to yeah. actually buy the club. Yeah. What happened with that? Because well, that it, just didn't happen. Yeah, really. so, I mean, I saw, like I mentioned, I mean, I saw the... The, 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 the company that bought it was basically an investment company. So what they would do, they were more used to flipping properties. So they would yeah. buy a tower block somewhere in Saudi Arabia for X million and sell it for X million. That was their kind of business model. And they thought they could do it with the football club because it owned the stadium. It wasn't that easy, obviously. Um, and particularly when, at the time, Leeds was in the championship. So you know, it wasn't receiving all the money that you would get in the Premier, in, in the Premier League. And so it was, it was very difficult to get that level of investment in so they could flip it. Um, and every kind of month that passed and the wages were going out and the income wasn't coming in, um, you know, and they start looking at selling all the good players to, to, to make money, it was, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And there were, you know, as each month went by, there were still no investors. Mm. So I thought, right, I'm going to have to do something about this because it's getting bad. And at the time, I wanted to go into politics. So as you mentioned at the beginning, I was well received, but then as the manager and director, you're kind of blamed a lot. You know? So yeah. I mean, and, you know, you, if you win a football match, you're, you're a hero, and if you lose it, you're, you're, you're yeah. a sinner. You know? so, um, so I put together a consortium, um, and it was basically the guy that owned the stadium, um, some of the old investors, um, the chap that was the main, um, the football shirt sponsor who owned a big insurance company. So we put a group of people together, um, and then we, used, we also had a small investment from an Italian, uh, 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 eccentric Italian billionaire, let's call him that. Um, and so that, that was working very well, and there was all sorts of commercial disputes, and ultimately what had happened is the, the Italian billionaire had gone directly to the then owners and said, I'll pay more for it, even though we had a contract. So it all ended up in disputes and, and all that kind of nonsense. Ultimately, it ended up the right way, because Leeds is now back in the Premier League. You know, so they had a new Italian owner that came in, took it over from, from the other, and it's, you know, it's now a Premier League club, which is what I wanted to, to achieve. Yeah. So I got that, what I wanted, you know, you know, it's back where it belongs. Um, but that was a, a long and, and painful t- um, kind of, um, you know, painful journey. And then I think during that as well, one of the things that I did, I thought that while I'm there, that I need to use the, you know, f- to, to make the changes that start need to be made in football. So make it more inclusive for women, yeah. make it more inclusive, you know, for LGBTQ people, which it wasn't at the time. And Leeds wrongly, you know, we're, we're talking almost 10 years ago, had a bit of a bad reputation. It was known as dirty leads. It was meant to be dangerous and aggressive and hooligans. And it really wasn't that. I, I didn't see that. You, you know, so, I, I, you know, I was, I was the first openly gay manager director of a football club and I would go and sit, in, sit with the fans and things like that. And, um, you, you know, and so all across the inclusivity spectrum, we, um, we tried to change things. So we were the first Stonewall Diversity football club um, as a diversity champion. And, and one of our players who played for LA Galaxy, a chap called Robbie Rogers came and then, yeah. you know, so it was, it was a really, really good time. Um, that was a rather silly move because, of course, owned by an Islamic bank, they weren't very happy with me. Um, and I remember there was a very, the, the day when Robbie Rogers came, we'd, we'd been sponsored by Stonewall, so we had all these Stonewall banners all the way across the stadium and they um, decided to turn up unexpected. So we were quickly trying to change all the oh. banners and it was, it, was, it was almost like a kind of a comedy, a dark comedy moment, yeah. but it was, um, so I managed to upset them. Um, and they, I don't want to go into so much detail, but they also then tried to make all sorts of um, long-term staff redundant in the bad ways. You know? So I stuck up for the local people, the club, um, and that angered a lot of people you know, back, back, in, back in the Middle East. So we, we then started to have bits of problems, which, which <laughs> ended up in a bit of a bad journey. But um, yeah, so that's, that's how it started. Well, I mean, a, a bit of a bad journey. I mean, I, that's... You are known. I mean, if anybody looks you up, your what you went through and the the situation in Dubai. I mean, that I don't understand how because I mean, you were accused uh, of, of embezzlement. Yeah. Um, and then how does that then end up in an, in an arrest in Dubai? I mean, what so yeah. With so that? what happened? So because of what I've mentioned with with Leeds and the consortium, they and I didn't know this at the time. Um, so we had, we had start, we'd issued legal proceedings against the, the then owners, as had the stadium owner, and we'd issued winding up processes yeah. against them and, and things like that. Um, but I didn't know, that, so I'd become a problem. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the way that people do business in the Middle East, um, as you know, anyone I think that turns on the TV can see, it's a very different culture, is, is certainly a lot different to what one should do business as. So you, you know, they don't really have kind of rules or norms or ethics. Yeah. Um, and so they had, they had, as I now know, had come up with this scheme to lure me over to Dubai 
effectively falsely accuse of me of stuff, which is very easy in Dubai, as I now know, because I help hundreds of people, you know, Brits that get in jail for having a drink in a bar, God forbid. Um, I mean, it's the most ridiculous place, but it's very easy to point at someone, accuse them, and they basically arrest and jail first and investigate later. So they tell me, oh, come to, you know, come to Dubai, you're a brother, we've known you forever, and we'll fix everything, we'll make a settlement. So get on a first-class flight from Manchester um, and then land in Dubai, and then within hours I'm on the floor of a jail being tortured. Um, with someone holding a, a, an agreement saying sign this and you can go um, and I'm a bit stubborn <laughs> so, so I, was, I, I said no um, and, and a few other swear words perhaps at the same time but um, that, I mean that's how it started um, and then so I was basically arrested I wasn't accused of anything we were just like your employers have accused you of something I was like well what well we don't know go go in there and they shove you in a horrid horrid squalid boiling Middle Eastern stinking um, jail, and it's one of the worst ones in the world there. Um, and it took them 15 months to actually start an investigation. 15 months. That's so backwards, because here you get the chance to actually defend yourself, yeah. and then I, I imagine give evidence to say, yeah. look, I've not done this. But yeah. it seems from from you know what you said and what you said in interviews, you were literally told you've done this, yeah. you're not going to have a chance Absolutely. to say your name, yeah. and then abuse and torture followed. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, and, and as I now know, I mean, when I, that was happening to me, I thought, it's only, I'm the only one that's happening to. But that's the norm there. And, and it, particularly when it comes to businessmen, you know, you, because if you've got connections or power, they use the jail system. I mean, even if you bounce a check there, you haven't paid your credit card bill, they put you in jail. Yeah. Um, and and so and and you see a lot. You know, you see a lot of Brits that live there that think it's it's as I did for ten years. You know, think that it's it's the Shangri La. It's amazing, but you live in a bubble. Yeah. And until you upset the wrong person who's got a little bit of power, then they can literally destroy lives. And that's what they do. So they use that corrupt jail system to and to, to basically as a litigation tactic to get what they want. Um, and I'm stubborn, so I didn't give in. Um, but I mean, just to show you how it ended in in absurdity. You know, just as I was about to be allowed to leave, so the day before I was flying back, um, they then didn't want me to go because they still wanted to try keep pressure on me. So they accused me of Twitter abuse. So obviously I'm in a squalid jail where you don't even have food yeah. or phones, and somehow I managed to have a Twitter account, and I was apparently using that, which is absurd. Um, and but they've accused you, so you have to go through. It took nine months of hearings. They kept me in jail for another nine months for using Twitter, and then I was acquitted, and then I came home, um, and then. Um, yeah, so that kind of brings you to, to, to 2016, which I think for them and as a country as well, because the company that I work for is owned by the royal family of the country, which then kind of links into now I know yeah. because I was at the, you know, I was assisting one of the one of the well several of the princesses escape the, the human rights abuses similar to what I was suffering, um, and that's kind of how it connects. Now I want to go back a little bit, you know, when you were asked to go to Dubai uh, initially. You know, because I know you and I know you're very wise. Um, was there anything at the time that made you think this seems a bit dodgy? Or well, no, because I haven't done anything wrong. So you oh, know, I mean, that, that's yeah, the thing. So you so, wouldn't think twice. Well, no, you wouldn't yeah. think. You know, if you if you would, if if I mean, I think they they accused me of somewhere or another pinching about four or five million. Um, but you know, if you've done that, you you're don't get on a plane it, yeah. and go to a country that you know is a human rights abuse or that you know is corrupt, that, and then you'd, where you don't need to go to. Because I didn't live there. I hadn't lived there for you know nearly what time? To, well, nearly two years. Um, so I mean, that's the for me. I mean, like, all my friends that know. I mean, that's the main thing. The main obvious thing. Why would I get on a plane and go back? Yeah. Um, so no, because I hadn't done anything. So I, I just. But the, I remember the funny thing was though. Um, I had a dinner with Ken Bates the day before because Ken Ken hated them at this point because they fired him for uh, as as chairman for use for not putting the right receipt in for a private jet um, to, back to his Monaco house because he lived in Monaco. Right. So they, 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 they're not, not great people. So I was having dinner with him at Chelsea because he Penthouse was still at Chelsea Football Club a couple of days before I went to Dubai and I remember him saying to me, don't go, it's a trap. And, oh, and wow. Yeah, because he hated, he didn't trust them, he didn't like them. But then, you know, I'd worked with him for a long time so I, and I had no reason not to. So, but he, he always teases me about that every time. When I, it's the first <laughs> thing when I came back because um, I went to one of his football parties, he has his birthday parties and he said to me, I told you, don't go, it's a trap. You know, after, after all of that, I'm like, thanks, Ken. But, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing, because uh, obviously you did talk about what you endured and what you went through, but back before you kind of spoke openly about what happened to you, you, you were quoted as saying you were treated kind of well by the guards and you were being well looked after. So, you know, you, you went from saying that you were treated well yeah. to then uh, actually saying you were abused. Were you told to say that for your yeah, own safety? Yeah, so, so during the first six months, 
I was treated, well, this is when I was locked up, I was treated really badly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, an English judge has now found that, you know, that I was, you know, an English judge is now, a Scottish judge rather, that I was tortured, that I was sexually abused and things like that. They were trying to get me to force, force, um, force sign things and, and, and sign false confessions. I then had a different lawyer who said to me, look, be nice to them, say good things about the police, and they'll let you go. So, of course, you do that. So I remember we even made a certificate and had it, like, to give to the police officer saying how wonderful they were. But then you know, you'll try anything, you know. Yeah. Um, so because that seemed to be the right thing to do, and then then it it, it wasn't. And and around about that time, I had an English lawyer, a, a big QC, who tried a private prosecution against the people that did that, and said, look, they've effectively human trafficked you out there. They've they've committed fraud on you because they've tricked you over there to try and accuse you of something you haven't done. So let's start a private prosecution. Um, so, because that's effectively what they did, they were using it as a, as a, as effectively a jail, a litigation tactic. Um, and so we started that, and uh, some of my evidence was put in that I was badly treated. Um, and then I got even worse. You know, the, the, the guards was, saw a copy of that, the police saw a copy oh. of that, and then I was beaten up even more. Hence, why we were like, okay, let's say they've done nice things, so they leave me alone. Um, so that's how bad it is there, and it's it's not like you would see in England. It's the most unsophisticated you know, primeval, unjust system that you can think of. Um, and, and they've just got a good PR company, you know, in terms of the brand to buy. Um, and, and like I said, and now, I've, I mean, I've helped hundreds of people get out of there, including princesses, um, who you, you, you would think that, you know, if you're the daughter of the ruler or the wife yeah. of the ruler, you can have everything you want, you think you wouldn't want to leave. But the fact that one after the other after the other is fleeing for their lives um, to England, um, I mean, the, the, the last wife has just uh, was in, in English courts, got the biggest divorce settlement in English history, you know, about, I think, a billion dollars. Um, and and um, so it's, um, it, that, I think, gives you evidence of how yeah. bad things really are. I mean, I know this was literally a living hell uh, for you. And knowing you personally, I know that actually coming home, even now you're still having treatment uh, for what you went through. But just to give people an idea, what did you go through? What kind of things would they do to you? So, I mean, it was, um, at the beginning, it was, and, and the, the interesting thing is I'd had actually surgery about two days before I went there. So I still had extremely strong kind of, I think they were called tramadol, these painkillers. So I was a bit delirious when I first landed. Um, and they, first of all, the, the lawyer acting for the then employers came along and was basically saying, sign this, but he was very chummy with the police and, and I didn't. So, I mean, it started kind of just pushing and whacking on the back of the head, but this is in a dirty, noisy, hot police station with police with guns screaming at you in Arabic, making you sign things in Arabic. Um, and it's not like you would have here, you know, I mean, you, you look at these kind of Wild West movies where, you know, you've got some kind of Colombian, you know, it's yeah. that, it's really, really... Did you have a translator? No, no, no. You're meant oh. to. They say that all these things happen, but they don't. You've basically got an angry police with a gun who will then put it on the counter. It's hot. You can't, and everyone's screaming and shouting in Arabic and you're being forced to sign something. And, you know, if you now read all the other people that come back, there was a young British student guy called Matthew Hedges who was at Exeter University doing a PhD. He, you know, he was there and said exactly the same thing, accused of spying because he was doing his PhD. Um, and, you know, it's one after the other after the other that you see in terms of these cases. Um, and so that's, first of all, it was just kind of pushing, slapping, do this, but then it got worse and worse and worse. So they were using tasers, electric cables, you know, they use extreme heat and extreme, basically, I mean, I just want to say AC because it makes it sound not bad, but they put you in rooms that are freezing. Um, and then, you know, there was sexual abuse, there was, it was really, really bad. Um, and, you know, and add to that, you've got the squalor is doesn't even describe what it's like i mean you know you can imagine how hot dubai is you can get to you know 40 50 degrees in the summer and you're in a basically a concrete block with no air conditioning you know you've got a a, a room that's meant for four you've got 30 people in it there's no fresh water there's n there's no sanitation you know it's it's the horror of that is but again you get used to it um but the physical abuse, you know, and the, the, one of the things, I mean, I helped defend, a, um, they were trying to extradite a Scottish grandfather to the UAE and I gave evidence yeah. of what, what happened. And <laughs> the, judge, the judge in that case, in the Scottish case, actually found, which was in a way nice to see because it's like someone finally believed you. He found that all these things, you know, he found that I was tortured, he found that I was sexually abused, he found that they were trying to force me to sign things in Arabic and everything. So you saw that in black and white, that actually, you know, it kind of validates what you've, you've been through. Um, but then 
it happens regularly there. You know, and they do it a lot to young British people to get in trouble, to, you know, and all to all sorts of citizens. But, you know, I've been helping people now since 2016, so, you know, quite a lot of time. And I see it again and again and again and again. It's what the police use because they, they want results as far as they're concerned. So they don't care if you've done it or you've done this or you're, you're innocent or you're guilty. You know, if you've been accused of something, they, they want to get they want to be able to you know, get the case done, yeah. and get a conviction and move on. So they will use any possible means because if you can just say I'm guilty, then they can process you and then next. And then it looks good for them because they have, and that's all they care about: statistics and numbers. They don't actually care about innocent or guilty. There, that's the problem. Um, the way that it's, it's it's set up. That's crazy. I mean, because were you actually convicted in the end then of, of what you were accused? So I was, yeah. So it wasn't embezzlement. It was um, breach of trust, which is this basically wasting money belonging to another. I mean, that's the definition okay. of it, which is, you know, if you buy the wrong brand of beer, you could be accused of it. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's the thing they throw so at people. they found something just to well, there was No, no, but there, there, there wasn't. So I wasn't, there was no real investigation 15 months. I wasn't allowed to take part in the investigation. I wasn't allowed to attend any trials. I wasn't allowed to submit any evidence. Um, I wasn't really allowed to see a lawyer. And, you know, so I wasn't involved. So you just kind of get told, oh, you've been found. And it was interesting because it was, um, I was, there was no, no action for 15 months, and then my story ended up in the Daily Mail. And then within about a week of this, because we managed to smuggle out a picture of me looking really sick, um, and, but we had to pay off a local police officer to do that. Um, and then within a week, all of a sudden, it's going through to the court, but I'm not allowed to go. And I'm deliberately not taken to the court. Um, and then we were about to appeal it. Um, and I was given the exact sentence of the time that I had been there. So it was basically, he's, he's, it's a problem for us in the media, just get rid of him. That was what they were told. Right, okay. But then, of course, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'm like, I'm going to appeal. Um, and then they told my lawyer, tell him not to appeal, just get him to go home. This is what we were told. Don't appeal, just, you can go home now, just go home. So, and, but then, you know, at the time, if you haven't done anything wrong, you're not, I'm, you know, and obviously being a lawyer, I'm like, well, someone's going to get away with accusing me of something I'm not done. Um, so I'm, again, stubborn, so I refused and carried on with the appeal. Um, but again, it's something that I see, again, like taking Matthew Hedges as the case, the young British student, same thing that they said to him, you know, they, because their system is so corrupt, they do something, they've made a mistake, they know they've made a mistake, but rather than admitting it, they're just like, oh, okay, you can go now. Well, yeah. no, it doesn't quite work like that. You've ruined my life for a year and a half. You've done these terrible things. You're not going to get away with it. Um, and they haven't, and I haven't let them. You, you know, I've exposed what they've done to the world now, I think, over the last eight years, and I'm sure they regret doing what they did. Um, because I think at the time, I was the most high-profile Brit that they've done that to. Um, and, of course, since then, I've helped, you know, three princesses and two wives leave. So, yeah, well, I think, I think I, I'm not the, the most... I'm not on their Christmas card <laughs> list, put it that way. Well, we're going to go, uh, obviously talk about the, the princesses, but were you... Because, obviously, financially as well, I mean, you were involved in a lot of business. Yeah. This would have cost you a lot of money. Were you compensated with what happened to not you yet. over there? Not yet. But that's an ongoing process. Yeah, it's, not, it's an ongoing process. And, it, you know, it's very difficult to fight a country. And I think that's the problem that... Anyone that gets in a situation like that, whatever country you've been abused by, you know, and it's usually these kind of Middle Eastern dictators and places like Russia that abuse people, yeah. you, how do you get justice against that country if they've done something? You know, if someone, you know, if someone crashes to you in a car and, and, you know, down, down, down the road, you can, you can get justice in a way. That's, that's yeah. not too hard. But if someone does the type of things to you and they're a country or they're the owner of a country, it's really hard. You've got a massive uphill struggle. And then they have all sorts of immunity from prosecution. You know, so, and, and that's the problem. The company that did it to me is owned by the royal family. Um, but you know, there's been some things that have now come clear. You know, one of the things that, for instance, when I was trying to um, defend myself, I knew that I had evidence. I knew I had all this, these documents that were no longer there. Um, you know, they were no longer on my computer, no longer on my phone, evidence that would have helped me. And you know, Amnesty International confirmed a couple of years ago, I was the first British person to be confirmed was hacked with this military grade software by the UAE. So, I, so it's things, you know, it takes time and you need to keep going, yeah. which I've done, you know, it's been what, eight, nine, 10 years. Um, but things are now starting to turn around. Um, and, you know, we've, we've already, well, we're about to issue proceedings against them for, for, for the hacking um, and, and in all sorts of intimidation and various other things. So we're getting there, but you just, you just don't have, you, you can't give up. But and that's the problem, because a lot of people that things like that happen to, you know, if you've been through such hells and horrors, mm -hmm. You just want to forget about it and move on. Yeah, a lot come of people home do, and just get back to. But that's life. how they get away with it, and that's how they do it again and again and again. And you know, it's like a bully in a way. If you let a yeah. bully get away with doing something, because you've been bullied and you're not now being bullied, you keep your mouth shut. They're going to do it against someone else, 
And so, you know, some people would just sit back and let them do that. But for me, I was like, well, no. <laughs> how, not... did, how did you manage that? Because I know you were, you really suffered. You had PTSD. You came home. You had to go uh, into hospital for, for quite a months. A long I spent time. months in hospital. So, yeah. how did you still have that ability to fight and appeal whilst going through so much mentally? Because that must have just drained you even more. Surely it was it was it was tough. I think the thing that helped me was that when I came back, I was the most high profile Brit that was there, and I yeah. met so many other people that were locked up. I mean, even now as we speak, there are so many British businessmen in these horrific jails in Dubai that have done nothing wrong other than being wrongly accused of something or they've upset a sheikh and they just lock them up and throw away the key. I mean, I could list off, you know, there's, yeah. uh, you know, there's a, a, a chap, he was in the uh, press recently, a guy called Ryan Cornelius. Um, the UN has just found that he needs to be released. He's just basically, they locked up and threw away the key because he upset a sheikh about 15 years ago. They do that a lot. So it's literally the jail is full of innocent people there. So... People then started to contact me um, and you know, can, can you help our family? Can you help this person? Can you help that person? Can you talk to the media? And through that, I kind of found strength because yeah. then I had to stay strong for them, as it were. And that was kind of 2016 to 2018. And then in 2018, I started helping a lady called um, Her Royal Highness Princess Latifah, who's the daughter of the ruler of the country. Um, and then I then had to stay strong for her. Um, and that you know, took nearly three and a half years, but we, we, we got her free. How did that happen with, with Latifah? Because she, like you said, so high profiled. How did that connection, how did she get in touch with you, find your details, yeah. and uh, how did that all happen? I mean, you know, I, she, you know, when I lived in Dubai, she was a friend of, of my assistant, but I didn't really know her, um, but I'd heard of her, you yeah. know, and, and I've heard of her, you know, women in the, despite what you see on TV, you know, when we look at Dubai, we see, you know, footballers' wives and girlfriends, you know, yeah. in bikinis, partying with champagne on the beaches. That's not real. The reality, you know, you see when you have women fleeing for their lives and, you know, m women are treated there because of the, not because of the religion, people say it's a religion, it's not the religion, it's because of the culture. Because of the culture in Dubai, women are treated very much as possessions. You know, women are not allowed to leave the country without the permission of a male in their family. That's how yeah. bad it is, you know. And women are not allowed to drive. And even though you, it, it is really, really bad, you know, you even still have laws in the UAE that say men are allowed to beat their wives. That's, that's a law, you know. So, you, you know, you, you, when you look at Latifa, um, you know, she's the daughter of the ruler. He's one of the richest men in the world. Um, and you always see him at races in England, or you used to see him with our queen, with races and with his then wife, Princess Haya, pretending he's this kind of icon of humanity. That was all fake. And that's now all come crashing down because we've exposed the truth. You know, Latifa suffered, you know, your viewers can see her videos still online on YouTube. It's been watched by millions of people around the world. You know, the, the horrors that she had to endure. Because you imagine you've got everything materially that you'd think that anyone would ever want. But she was so desperate to leave, she spent two decades of her life risking her life and other people's trying to get out. This was her second escape attempt. Um, and, you know, she contacted um, me and asked for help. Um, and, you know, when someone in such a terrible situation that you know to be true because you've yeah. gone through it um, says help, you kind of ignore the fact that she's a daughter of a ruler and he's got armies and guns and yeah. he kills people and, well, well, I don't want, you know, allegedly kills people. Um, the, you kind of, that goes away and you just think, right, I've got to help her. And that was, you know, I was sitting in my little cottage. In, well, actually, no, I was, at, um, no, I was in my cottage in Cornwall in, in the morning when that happened. Um, and then a couple of weeks later when we got the video that we released, um, I was in Mullion Cove Hotel with no Wi-Fi trying to watch this, the, the, ultimately the video that, uh, one of the videos that helped get a release. And you chose to release that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2018, um, Latifa was very intelligent. So she n effectively knew what would happen once she tried to escape if it went wrong, um, which she did. You know, she, she escaped Dubai across Oman, which is a bordering country. And then by boat, almost got to India. She was a few miles off the coast of India. And what we now know through hacking and monitoring of phones, uh, a military force was sent to recover her and the people that escaped with her, a lady, a lady called Tini O'Hein, you know, a friend of hers, Finnish lady. Um, and they were taken back to Dubai, locked up in secret jail for a while. And then the media, we released a video of Latifa saying that she was leaving, why she was leaving, what was happening to her, and what should happen next to the world. And, you know, it kind of, it kind of enlightened heart and minds across the world and it you know became various bbc panoramas you know 60 minute documentaries it was headline news everywhere um because people were like shocked because they thought dubai was this kind of 
symbol of the modern world in the Middle East, when the reality was you've got the daughter of the, the ruler running for her life after two decades of abuse um, for the second time. Um, and so we released and when I received the video, like I said, I was at Mullion Cove Hotel. I remember it well, I was at a friend's birthday party at Mullion Cove Hotel and there's no real signal up there. And the Wi-Fi wasn't very strong and I'm trying to watch this hour, nearly hour long video on a mobile phone and I was like, yeah, so that was a, it's a, yeah, I remember that very well. Was there ever a moment where you step back and thought, what am I doing? Because the risk to your life, because I imagine you'd be worried if there was a hit out on you because you're making so much noise, it's impossible to avoid you. You're on TV, you know, and you are very strong-willed and you were doing everything right for Latifah. Yeah. But was there ever a moment you thought, that could be someone around me now trying to, trying to kill me to shut yeah, me up? Yeah, at the beginning, because we had that video and we'd only released a portion of it at that time. We hadn't released the whole video and we had other videos. So... You, you know, you kind of, I, th I think probably, um, probably just perhaps the right side of crazy, but at the time when you do something and you don't realise, and then we then start to, I mean, I was sitting on my kind of house in the middle of nowhere in the dark in Cornwall, and, you know, my other friends were all around the world, and each evening we would send messages to each other to say we were okay. But, you know, I remember taking copies of that video and they're buried in all sorts of fields around Cornwall because I thought, if something happens to me, I want this video safe. So I would yeah. bury all this evidence so someone will be digging one day in the field in Cornwall and find, a, find this video because <laughs> I need to make sure it was safe. So, um, so at the beginning, we were all very, very worried until the full video went out. But it was very difficult to get that out because a lot of the media were like, this can't be true. That's yeah. what we were getting. And, and, and you know, I remember at one point, I mean, the Daily Mail were the ones that supported us the most and they released it all. We, but that took a while. And until it was all out there, we were very frightened because the UAE knew we had this video. It hadn't yet gone out and they wanted to stop that happening. And we were very frightened. Um, but we had no choice. But I remember, I remember almost begging the report the Daily Mail, they're going to kill us to get that video yeah. out there. But then it went out. And then things, we, we felt a lot safer. We now know that they has they hacked us with illegal software. They had us under surveillance, even in Cornwall. Well, Nicole yeah. Kidman, uh, yeah, <laughs> was yeah, like somebody yeah. that looked like her. You actually noticed? Yeah, um, no, I was in I was in London, um, and it was the day that I so later we, we, after they basically captured Latifa. Um, it took us a few months, but we managed to find out where she was, and we smuggled a mobile phone into her jail. Again, that was don't know how I managed that from Cornwall. Don't ask. But, um, so it, it, we managed it, um, and. Um, she had that for a year and a bit, um, which ultimately is what helped get her out. But um, ultimately it was found. And a few days after that was found, I was in London um, and we were about to show the videos that she had recorded from her jail where she said she was a hostage, help me, um, which again came out in a BBC panorama a while back now and ultimately oh, yeah. helped release her. Um, but the day that we were doing that, I noticed this rather striking looking aid lady, looked a bit like Nicole Kidman, kind of following me. Um, outside, I was actually in hospital, um, and, and then I went to meet the BBC, the Panorama, and I noticed her in a completely different part of London, the exact same woman. And, you know, you know everyone was, well, my friends always tell me I'm paranoid, but, and then I forgot about it. Um, but then a few months later, I was contacted by Amnesty, Amnesty International, who basically told me that they believed my phone had been basically infected with a thing called Pegasus, which is this military-grade spyware, which is only licensed to countries for use against people like terrorists. So I let them check my phone, and then it was confirmed last year, it's actually almost a year since it was confirmed, it was confirmed that I was the first British person to have this confirmed on their phone by Amnesty International, which, I mean, you can't prove that it was the UAE, but yeah. I certainly haven't upset any other countries, I hope, rather than the UAE, the Dubai, so, yeah. And, and the, 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 the lady that was monitoring me did look remarkably like... Nicole, which, which was actually a bit of a kind of a life goal, because I made page three of the Telegraph I, uh, yeah. with a picture of Nicole Kidman. <laughs> so, you know, for a young boy from Cornwall, that, that's, a, that's a result. <laughs> it's worth noting that whilst you were kind of um, helping Latifa yeah. and you were getting the message out that they were doing their best to ruin your name. Oh, absolutely. And those false yeah. articles that you were a hitman, yeah. you were paid money to... I mean, absurd, absurd. So what they... and But now I know, because at the same time, um, Princess Haya, who was the last husband of the... Last wife, rather, of the, the, the Dubai ruler, Latifa, Latifa's stepmother um, and the daughter of the King of Jordan, um, she realised what had happened to Latifa and then she took her kids and she fled Dubai with her kids. And again, your viewers can just Google Princess High's name, you'll see it's all across the, the, the press and she, she won her divorce over here. Um, so we were helping her as well. Um, and, but because of that, you know, what the UAE was trying to do was discredit us because they wanted to make people believe that what we were saying was lies.
yeah. you know, you know, so the, the, I mean, the articles that they, because they own obviously newspapers and they own TV channels and they own, so the stuff that was going out, I mean, I, I showed you one article, I mean, there was, and it literally went around the, around the, around the, the local village. It was that I was some kind of Hamas terrorist, you know, hitman. And I'm sitting there in my garden in the morning eating an ice cream and someone sends me, the, you know, I got paid 14 yeah. million. And, and, but that's what they do. And, you know, and, and, and when you look at the Princess Higher judgment in, in the court, that's what the English court found. They found that she was targeted with the most extreme intimidation and harassment and everyone around her and threats because they use all their money and all their power to destroy people. Um, and it didn't work in their case for, yeah. with me because I wasn't giving up. I mean, I was, you, you know, I, I've, I've worked in football. I've been called all sorts of names that, you know, there's nothing that they could have done that I haven't been called at football. I wasn't called an assassin at football. But, um, <laughs> so that was probably a good training for that. But, um, you, you know, when someone does that, it's again the bully thing. And I think maybe that comes from, you know, being a gay kid that you, you know, you stick up, for bull you stick up to bullies. So maybe that, that helped a bit, but I wasn't giving up. And now we're going through the process of clearing up all the fake news, you know, reporting things to yeah. Google, and, but it takes forever. Get it removed. Um, yeah, but I mean, the things, the, the things that I read about myself, it was hilarious sometimes when you read them. I mean, it was, uh, yeah. So what about Latifa now? I know obviously yeah. you, you're not allowed to disclose whereabouts and stuff like that, but how is she? So, I mean, a year ago, so it was February last year, we... After you know, taking a long time to decide to do this, we released the, some of the videos that she recorded from her jail. It was a very powerful one that started, I'm a hostage. And up until that point, the UAE had lied to the world, saying, oh no, she's fine, she's at home, she's, she's not very well, you know, so she's at home, fine, and these are very bad people that tried to kidnap her. That was completely untrue, as we know. Um, and, but we had all these videos, we sat on them, and then she went missing because they found the phone. And then we, were, we got to the stage in last year that, right, we need to do something. It's been six months, we haven't heard from her. We're very worried. She hasn't been wheeled out in public for some kind of propaganda stunt. So we, together with Panorama, and we actually got Panorama, we actually got the BBC working with Sky News, which is almost unthinkable, um, and 60 Minutes in Australia and the Daily Mail. So we had a consortium of media which don't usually work together, but that's how big this story was. Mm. And they'd been sitting on those videos for months because we trusted them. So they all had those videos. Um, we were just using the right time and it was a slow news week so we decided right this is the time to put the panorama out and the BBC was so worried that the UAE would try and stop it it wasn't even advertised it was a change to the scheduling and it was like almost a simultaneous broadcast with and you can still see them now the BBC panorama so we released all these videos um, and the videos did many things including exposing former world leaders that had been involved in effectively the cover-up of this kidnap one of them was the former president of Ireland Mary Robinson who then following those videos being released, said that, you know, because she was involved in a, a kind of a photo stunt with, with Latifa, she, she actually said that it was the worst mistake of her life. You had Boris Johnson talking about Latifa, you had the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, talking about Latifa, the EU president, and then the UN basically said, you have to let her go now. So we'd managed to get the story so big that no one could ignore it anymore. Yeah. And ultimately what happened is that a few months back, you know, Latifa was pictured with the current head of the United Nations in Paris. So I can't go into too much detail, but Latifa is no, you know, she's alive and she's no longer in jail and she's able to meet the head of the UN. And that's something that had it not been for three years of non-stop campaigning and the media, because it's the yeah. media that got her free. It's not politicians. It's none of those people. It's the media and, you know, everybody on their Twitter accounts, their social media and sharing and Instagram, because those are the people that, that, that together got this girl her life, but also you know, created that spark of inspiration for every woman in the Gulf and yeah. every downtrodden person, you know, and, and, you know, everyone that's been abused there, every minority, disability, whether, you, you, know, you know, they now have hope that however bad things are for you, you can get your freedom. And I think that's the, the thing that I fought for and, and I'd do it all again. Wow. Uh, do you keep in touch with her? Yeah, you, I, I, yeah, I can't. You can't. Yeah. But what we, yeah. I, I do want to go into, because what you've done was incredible, but, I mean, you have your life as well, relationships and stuff like that, and, I mean, all your time, all yeah. your energy and focus was helping Latifa. Yeah. What did that do for your personal life? It was... Um, <laughs> maintaining relationships and stuff? I mean, you know, when we first got the phone into Latifa, it was meant for emergencies only, um, because, you know, so it was get all the evidence, get copies of bad stuff that are happening. It's not here to chat. But what would happen is that they were trying to pressurise her. You know, they would do things like put razor blades in her room. They would put stopwatches in her room. They, would try and, they were trying to break her. They wanted her to give in, record some propaganda that wasn't fake, and she wouldn't do it. 
Um, so ultimately what then started to happen is I ended up spending a lot of time talking to her um, to try and keep her strong. So we, we developed a really good relationship. So you know, I'd go out in the morning and I would send her pictures of the sunsets in Cornwall on the beach and, and pictures of pasties. And you know, we, even, we even bought um, eggs and incubated them so she had virtual pets. So yeah. I've, I've got like loads and loads of chickens running around. That, 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 <laughs> no, but it helped keep her strong. So yeah, no, I course. would spend four or five hours a day talking to Latifa. Um, and, you, you know, the, the toll of that on my personal relationships, because, you know, my partner at the time was kept on saying to me, who are you spending five hours a day talking to on the phone that I can't see? And of course you can't say. Um, and, you know, it cost me three relationships. You know, I broke up with three, three, wow. three, three, um, you know, three people because of it. Because I, mean, I understand, you know, but I couldn't tell anyone. Um, but the thing is, I think you know they now feel a little bit guilty. Now they know the reality that it wasn't some other guy or some other girl. It was a hostage, hostage princess from the Middle East. So, um, but it's very difficult. But you can't, you know, you're trying to save a life. Yeah. And until anyone's been in that situation, you can't, you can't give up on that. You know, that's the most important thing because there's literally a person's life and the ones that follow. So that has to take precedence. Well, I mean, talking of uh, ones that follow, you literally are now one of the highest profile human right figures uh, in the UK, if not bigger. Um, and I know that you probably thought after this, right, I can get back to, to living my life, but people still come to you for help. I mean, are you currently working on, on helping people? At yeah, the I'm, I'm currently helping in, in two Middle Eastern ladies, which I won't go into more detail with, but two. Um, I did say I would never do it again. Um, but I have a problem saying no. Um, and, you know, I, I help a couple of other people, but that I think are vic victims of injustice. Um, you know, one of the chaps, one, one chaps in, in, in America who's been, you know, he's a very wealthy chap. He's been targeted wrongly because he's an easy target. Um, but, you know, two other very high profile women in, in, in the Middle East, one of which will become quite public soon, um, uh, that the, 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 I'm, I'm helping at the moment. Your life is it literally is like a James Bond movie. I mean, you wouldn't expect somebody that lives in the morning, uh, a, a you know, successful businessman, went through all of this because you'd think after your Dubai, uh, Dubai help, that was it. But then you were involved, uh, I mean, and your face was plastered all over. You don't have to Google your name yep. uh, and you were everywhere. So I think it's incredible what you did. And thanks to that now, Latifa hopefully will live the life that she wanted to uh, yep. before all of that happened. I think that's the thing. I think Cornwall played a part role in that because I think, you know, had I done all of this from London, I don't know if I could have done it with the, but I think the fact that Cornwall's so pretty and, you know, you go and look at the view and then all the stress kind of goes away. Yeah. You know, so I think, and, and you know, my house was very much a campaign centre. So even Latifa's cousin, um, you, you know, member of the, the then royal family would come down to Cornwall, um, you, you know, and everyone would come to the house because we could work on the campaign and it was very relaxing and um, you know, very different to London. So I think that, that helped a lot. So I think Cornwall's got a very big role to play in the part of rescuing that princess. I know, you know, you are keeping active. It was only a couple of weeks ago we saw you on GB News uh, being interviewed by Nigel Farage, uh, yeah. you know, about your story. Um, so what, what's next for you now? Will you be doing more stuff? Because you, you suited being on GB News. It, yeah. it felt right. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of commentary on GB News yeah. at the moment. I'm, I'm, you know, I do a lot of work for them. As, I always get wheeled out as the human rights lawyer and... and um, and, and always get lots of abuse, for, <laughs> lots of abuse for that. So I do, I do a lot of work with GB News. I do a lot of work with Al Jazeera, talking about human rights case. And of course, there's been a lot in human rights at the moment because, at the moment, the, the, the whether it'll happen now or not, but Boris Johnson's government was abolishing the Human Rights Act, replacing it with what they've called a Bill of Human Rights, which is effectively a Bill of No Human Rights. Whether that will now go ahead, we don't know. And we also saw the the, the Rwanda. Um, yeah. program where they were trying to basically ship off um, you know, asylum seekers to foreign countries. Um, so I was asked to speak a lot on that. You know, we've got a, a situation with football at the moment, so we're bringing in an independent regulator for football, um, which is one of the things that was mentioned in the Queen's speech. Now, you know, you're seeing a lot of, you know, I, I'm bad in the sense that I brought in a foreign, you, you know, I brought in Middle Eastern money to football 10 years ago, so you could have, as Nigel blamed me for starting it. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw um, that. But that's something that I'm very much against now. You know, it's called sports washing. It's where countries like Saudi that abuse human rights buy up football clubs, buy up sports clubs. So everybody forgets of all, you know, the time, you know, shortly after Saudi was bought, they go and behead 82 people, you know, and, and they use sports to cover up these abuses. So when we think of Saudi now, they've just, you know, rather controversially trying to take over golf. Um, we forget about the bad things they're doing and the terrible things that are happening to people every day there. And we think, oh, look, they're sponsoring this player or they own that football club. Aren't they great? But I think now with the new regulator coming in, that's a good chance to change those rules. Um, and then certainly something else that I'm doing in football down in, down in Cornwall is that football doesn't have, you know, an all-inclusive football team. 
Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, you could argue that football doesn't really have a decent football team at all. Um, you know, every other every other county in the country has you know LGBTQ diverse, inclusive football teams that play in a, a league, and that's something that I think would be great to have in Cornwall, so that you know every little kid that you know it might feel a little bit different to others in every single school in Cornwall gets the chance to see you know players that that remind them of them or feel how they do and you know we've seen jake daniels be the first premier league football come out um the football um, top football um not premier league top footballer come out at blackpool blackpool's also not in the not, not in the premier league um and um that so was I, a uh, moment though wasn't it that was one of those moments where it, it was big it was uh, big and, it, and it's long time coming but it to, you know to me it shouldn't be an issue you shouldn't yeah. have to have a footballer actually say that you shouldn't have to have anyone say that. Yeah. You know, it's you know you don't see, and people are going to say that I'm belittling, you, you, you know, sexuality now. But you know, you shouldn't have to come up. You know, you, you, want, you don't want a football saying I like I like Jaffa cakes instead of digestives. Yeah, I it's know what you mean. and yeah. I, I want to see a situation where, you know, saying you know who you choose to love is as absurd as making a declaration that you prefer a Jaffa cake to a digestive. Yeah. You know, and hopefully one day you don't actually because it shouldn't be a big issue. Right? It shouldn't be. And until we get to the stage where it isn't a big issue, then I think there's a lot of work to do. And that's one of the reasons why I want to bring it to Cornwall. So how, what, what's, the, you know, what's that looking like going forward? You know, where do you start? Have you started? Uh, is it going to be documented? Yeah, so, so the, the idea is that basically we've, we've, we've got a couple of names which we're working on. Um, you know, we've got a, a team together. It's, very, it's early days. We've got a team together. Um, and effectively, you, you're building a club from scratch that will play... Um, in, 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 a, in a league that's across the UK. Obviously, the problem that you get with Cornwall is it's the, 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 you know, the location is so far yeah. and the other teams, but we, 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 you know, we've, we've, we've got a, enough funding together for that. So it's basically you're starting a football club from scratch. It's almost like the movie, you know, Bend It Like Beckham. If you remember yeah. that movie, it was a ladies' football team. So it's, it, you know, it's something, something similar to that. But it's a really exciting project, um, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Because like I said at the beginning, you know, when I was at school, it was always football. No, sorry, it was always rugby yeah, when I was rugby. at school. It was always rugby. So, you know, for football, if, if people come, you know, you get a couple of famous um, players that come to your, your school and, you know, invite people to come into an inclus- an all-inclusive football team. You know, Cornwall, we've got the saying one and all. And football really should be for one yeah. and all. For you, I mean, well, for Cornwall, I think it's a big thing because with your success within football, to lead something like this and introduce it into Cornwall is fantastic. And you're so well-connected in that industry. So will you be looking at some of your connections to kind of make this big, you know, get, yeah. it, get it out there, get it spoken about? Are you going to bring some of your contacts down? Yeah, we're bringing in some big names. We're bringing in some big names and the hope is to bring in, at the start, some big players to get it to go. Um, you know, retired players, things like that. But some, some, some legends in football we're going to bring yeah. in. Um, and, and, you know, we're hoping that we'll have some, a, a lot of media attention to that as well and, you know, maybe even a, a TV documentary around that. So we've spoke a lot about um, Latifa and everybody you've helped, but how are you now? I mean, after everything you've been through, what's your life looking like? How do you feel? Uh, do you feel kind of light at the end of the tunnel? It's, it's a very interesting question. I think, you know, how do I even answer that? You've got me there. Because um, you, yeah. you never talk about yourself with how you feel. You always talk about other people and helping other people, but I've never actually sat down with you and... You've spoke about your feelings yeah. or, or, or how you're doing. So it. I think you know. I keep saying I won't do any more big campaigns. I think, but you know, if I can, you, you know, there's a few things left that I want to do. The football thing down here is one of the things that I've wanted to do for a while, um, and the people I'm currently helping. Um, and, and then after that, I probably will go and buy an ice cream bar on a beach somewhere in Cornwall, <laughs> and, then, and, 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 and then and then and then retire. Um, you know, but I think doing this helps you like, helps you recover from what you know when you've had a country intimidate you, physically abuse you, sexually abuse you, accuse you of all these terrible things, illegally hack you, um, you, you know, that's an awful lot to deal with, but by helping other people, it helps you deal with it. Yeah. How I'll feel when I stop all of this, come and ask me again. You, I know you, you still have treatment, is that right? Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you think how many years it's been, you're yeah. still needing that, that help, that support, that treatment, so that gives yeah. you an idea really, of what you went through. Yeah, I th- yeah. I mean, I think, I think helping Latifa exacerbated the, the PTSD because, you know, hearing gunshots at the end of a, a, yeah. a, of a phone when someone's been kidnapped, which is effectively what I heard, um, brings it all back. But we'll get there. You know, the thing, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. How long that tunnel is, I don't know. But. <laughs> and I know from obviously talking, yeah, we had a drink yesterday, um, and I know we can talk about at the moment, um, it's, it's one of those things in the industry, but there are some big things coming f- 
for you. Yeah, there's, there's some big things in terms of media, in terms of football, yeah. um, some, some other big things I haven't mentioned in terms of football and what's happening you know, in, in, in the autumn, winter that I'm getting involved in as well. Um, so there's a lots of good stuff happening, which, I'm, which is really positive and I'm really pleased about. Well, I'm glad things are going better for you. And it's great to actually finally get you on the show because, like I said, I've known you for a long time. We've never sat down. And actually, when, when you know, I know you, but doing research, I thought, wow, like, I didn't realise how much you had been through, um, especially with the, the hacking of your phone, because I know you actually confronted the actual, was it the software company You know, I did. Itself? I was in London when I was told. And I was asked by Amnesty International because my case was on the front page of The Guardian, front yeah. page of The Washington Post and everything. So Amnesty International said, can you come to our protest? The, 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 the people that produce got an Israeli company called NSO, were at the International Security Conference trying to sell it. So can you come and protest outside? Um, so I thought, of course I'll come. And I suddenly thought, actually, I'm going go to I'm gonna go and ask them to take it off my phone. I had this crazy idea. So I applied for a pass. Um, and one would have thought they would have, like I said, Googled me and realized, let's not give him a pass at the International yeah. Security Conference. But they did. So I went along with my phone and a secret camera. And then went up to the stall and, the, and introduced myself very politely um, and handed my phone, it wasn't the real phone, but handed my phone over and an amnesty report and asked them very nicely to take it off. Um, and th that was um, th th the shock on their faces. I don't think anyone's I, yeah. ever done that, but you've seen the video. So, the yeah. two guys, I mean, they couldn't take their eyes off you and they, like, they were what, what? whispering with their masks. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was, that, was, I, that was an enjoyable Would that moment. be out there for people to see eventually? Yeah, it, we, have, yeah. We, we, haven't, we, we are more than welcome to release it. We, ha we haven't released it yet. We were going to, but we decided not to, But because um, things moved on. Yeah. Um, um, but, yeah, that's, um, that was fun times. Well, David, honestly, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming all Pleasure. the way up uh, and being so open because I know it's, it was traumatic for you. So to kind of relive that in an interview, I know it would have been difficult. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Good thank to see you. you.